on behalf of the Raza Foundation and the India Habitat Center. Namaskar. On behalf of the Raza Foundation and the India Habitat Center, we welcome you this evening to V.S. Guy Tonde Memorial Lecture to be delivered by Professor B. N. Goswami. Raza Foundation organizes eight annual memorial lectures named after some of the masters of our time. Mr. Krishan Khanna, please come. There's a seat. There shall be a seat for you anyway. <laughs> come, come. Yeah, yeah. Krishan? Yeah, yeah. You can let down you for we only interrupt when a master arrives, otherwise not. <laughs> because at least in Raza Foundation, only artists are masters, nobody else. And these uh, memorial, annual memorial lectures are named after Kumar Gandhar, Habib Tanvir, Kevicharan Mahapat, Charles Korea, Daya Krishna, Manikal, whom I am leaving, anyway, some other name. And of course, here's Gaitonde. Gaitonde was, of course, as you know, one of the modern masters who belatedly is getting wide international recognition. But the reason why we instituted this memorial lecture was that he was a very close friend of Rasa. Rasa had great admiration for Gaitonde. We are very happy to have Professor B. N. Goswami to deliver this lecture. Memorial lectures are an attempt to create a body of critical thought by experts. So we leave the matter to the lecturer to decide about whom to speak on, as long as it is in the, <coughs> around the central theme being visual arts. And therefore, Professor Goswami has decided to talk about a great Pahari painter Manipu. And as you know, Bian Goswami has been discovering these masters whom we have not yet recognized as masters. Uh, these are the other masters, not the masters who are very visible, very well known, whose biographies are available. Here are some people who, whose even date of birth, etc., uh, is not very clear. And I remember last time. Uh, Professor Goswami telling us he had gone all the way to Haridwar and met the Pandas to and look through their Bahis to find out some details about the Pahari painter he was engaged with. As you know, he is a very well known art critic, art historian, and has been teaching for a number of years. Last time, we had the happy occasion of supporting one of his publications called 100 Great, The Masters of Indian Painting, 1100 to 1900, in which he chose 100 paintings and wrote on them. And the Raza Foundation provided some assistance to the Penguin India, who published it. He also worked with us on another project of his choice, Sources of Indian Aesthetics, uh, which the book is, read, is now with the OUP or wherever yeah. Yeah, to come out. 
So he is, a, he is an old friend of the Naza Foundation, and we are very happy to have him here. So there you are, Dr. Goswami. at the outset how honored I feel to be able to associate my name with the great master, Gai Thunde. I've never had the pleasure of meeting him. I'm familiar with his work, and I'm truly grateful that I was thought of, worthy of being associated with his name. But to get back to my own work, the book Manku of Guler, which has just been released. When I wrote that book, I was aware of the fact that I was running many hazards. And I'll tell you why. A long time ago, Dr. M. S. Randhava, who was a connoisseur, collector, <coughs> he and Mr. Khandalawala, Mr. Khandalawala, also a connoisseur, also a collector, were contemporaries, but did not get along too well with each other. Mr. Khandalawala produced a volume this size, and about this size, Pahari Miniature Painting. And Dr. Randhava had the fortune or the misfortune of having to review it. <laughs> and I don't remember the full context, but towards the end, he wrote, he said, there is a rumor going around that in the other world, all authors will have to carry their books on their heads. <laughs> if there's anything true about it, then I'm afraid Mr. Kandalawala will be greatly inconvenienced. <laughs> so when I wrote this book, it is heavy, this. Uh, I can't lift it my left hand. I know that I run that risk of having to carry it in my head uh, when I come up there. The second hazard that I'm running is, and that is that a number of people do not believe in the existence of money. So, you know, when they say, inna fana meri, inna baka meri, mujhe ae shakil na dhoondiye, mein kisi ka husne khayal hoon, mera kuch wujood o adam nahi hai. So, some people believe that this manuku is a husne khayal, somebody's figment of somebody's pleasant imagination. I don't believe that, obviously not. In producing this book, however, I invite a great deal of criticism, I'm afraid. The reason for that is, entire book, 512 odd pages and so on, devoted to the work of one master. And what do we know about him in terms of facts? Remarkably little. I wrote a book on Nansuk some 20 years ago, there was some material to build on. Nansuk's own entry in the Bahis of the Pandas, his inscriptions and so on. But in the case of Manuku, we just have a tiny little inscription by him, two and a quarter lines in the Takri script in the Bahi of a Panda. That's all that has survived in Manuku's own hand in respect of information. The date is given, 1736. He went to Haridwar along with two cousins of his, and there they made an entry in the Bahi of the Panda saying that we are here in this particular year. That's the only date that we have in Manuku's own hand. Then we have another document, which is not in his hand. He painted it, but there's a colophon at the end of that particular document the Geet Govind of Jayadeva, which bears the date 1730. And it has a long set of four lines of colophon start, and all in Sanskrit, and so on. So that very clearly gives the date 1730 and 1730. This is all that we have. Misfortune? 
accident of history? I don't know. So therefore, whatever I'm saying here is based only on these two slivers of information. But I'm confident that whatever I'm saying here, if there is some reason behind it, it is not pure figment of, of my imagination and so on. But I remind myself, and I think it's a useful thing to remind oneself of, of a great poetic utterance in Persian. Zuba darkash ay marde bisiyar da ke farda kalam nist bhar be zuba. He says, pull your tongue back, O man who thinks he knows too much. Because the pen of the future will have a tongue of its own. A wonderful utterance. Cautionary, meditative in a certain sense, and useful for a man like me to remember on this particular occasion. And I would like to go into one little detail of that particular verse. Farda qalam nist bar bezuba. Qalam, the pen of the future. The qalams were not the kind of pens that we write with. They were reed pens. And when you shave them to get a, a thing to point a visit to write, we always call it a zuban. Right? So the farda qalam nist bar bezuba. Whatever the future will bring, we do not know. I could be proven wrong tomorrow. Maybe this instant, somebody is writing something on Manaku, which completely contradicts whatever I have said in this. But I built a theory around this. The theories are all fragile things. You know, in Kabirji's words, Balu ki bheet, pavan ka khamba. It is a wall made of sand. It is a pillar made of air. That's fragile as non-existent possibly, possibly as that. So this Balu ki bheet, pavan ka khamba, which is a kind of theory with which I started, Nanko, so and so, probably born in the year 1700, probably died in the year 1760. But whatever remains of this theory of mine, or this reconstruction of mine, one thing I am certain of, his work will survive. His work demands not only attention, but the greatest respect for this man, thought. And he took leaps of thought in his work, which are beyond belief sometimes. I have started taking the Geet Govind of 1730, which is definitely by Manku, as a pivot. And, with, and keeping that pivot in my mind, I go backwards and forwards, the only way one can proceed. What might have gone before that and what came after that particular term, 1730. I'll not engage you into any kind of a speculation any further about this. I'd like to turn to the painting that he made. This is a painting which Gaitunde might have liked very much. Because there are elements of abstraction in his work, in Manuku's work. Incidentally, the word Manuku, the name Manuku, is a very good name, right? But this show his father had two sons. And both of them, he must be, have been a prescient man. He gave them wonderful names. A younger one called Nansuk, the delight of the eye. And the older one, Manuku. Manuku is an expansion of the term Manak, which means a ruby, precious. But those who, those who know gemology also know that the ruby is a stone of mystifying thought. And that it has a fire inside it which keeps it red like this. Manuku had that fire in his belly. Manuku had that extraordinary ability, you know, to reach out and do things which nobody before him had done. Look at this particular painting, which is an iconic painting in my own mind. 
one of the great paintings in the history of Indian art. Probably one of the greatest paintings in the history of Indian painting. What do we see here? It's called the cosmic egg. We can call it the golden egg. We can call it the golden womb. The Sanskrit name is Hiranya Garbha. Hiranya is gold, Garbha, womb, or in the texts, in all texts of all cultures, in, in texts of all cultures, there are speculations about how it all began, the origin of this particular work. How did creation begin? We're not into a Big Bang theory, we're not talking about evolution and so on and so forth, but there is the notion that how did it all begin? As early as the Rig Veda, there is a whole sukta called the Hiranyagarbha sukta. And there are text after text which comes back to the idea, where did it all begin, how did it all begin. This is what Manuku envisioned. One day, it says, when this earth, the Mahapralaya had taken place, the great dissolution had come about, and then eons of time passed, and then suddenly one day a great big golden egg descended from the heavens on earth and lay still on the waters of eternity. Maddeningly beautiful description. Extraordinary description in the text. Now the challenge for Manuku was, how do I show it? And this is what he comes about. There are texts which says, one one of the texts says, the egg was golden because the sun was hiding inside it. One day a crack appeared in this golden egg. And out of that creation stepped out. So what Manuku does is to leave out all edges, all borders, nothing of the kind. No strip of land is to be seen. There are these endless waters of eternity which spread from one edge to fine edge and so on. And on that perfectly oval, perfectly fashioned, and glistening like gold, this egg rests. But my attention repeatedly goes to his treatment of water. How does he render this water? Water, I mean, in an ocean, I mean, can be rendered in various ways. Ordinarily, you would think of waves and so on and so forth, the ripples and this or foam somewhere and so on. But he does not do that. On the other hand, he creates a pattern which are walls, one concentric things and so on, like this and so on. And I am absolutely certain in my own mind that he had access to somebody who knew dendrology, how to tell the age of a tree with the rings of time. So he's creating these rings of time on timeless Extraordinary. I could be wrong. I mean, I have no, no means of ascertaining this and so on. But I read it in this particular case. Is this the only way that Manuku knew how to render water? Of course not. Obviously not. Because, I'm sorry. You know, there was a conference some time ago on the 1400th year of the uh, Hijra, and everyone, please don't look at this. We'll come to that afterwards. I am trying to go, get back to the first slide, and I hope that I succeed in that. If I take you through the entire thing, the game will be given away. So you please bear with me for a short while, while I get to slide one. And where is that? Uh, in the seven minutes, the Hijra conference I'm talking about was because everyone was given seven minutes to make a presentation. And Ananda Krishna, a friend of ours, said, let me begin from the end. So I'm, because seven minutes, what can I do or something like that. And somebody else said, no, no, we should invent a seminar wheel. We put a paper into that, give it a kind of a twirl, and the paper is red or something like that. But I'll, I'll come back to that in just a moment. My eyes are going to. Oops. 
I'm sure you are getting nervous how many slides I'm going to show you. Somebody with the camera. Yes. I'm so sorry that I. Technology is not my best suit. Anyway. Sir, it's still number four. I'm sorry? It's still slide number four. Thank you. He could do that, but he could also produce images like this. What is it that we are looking at? In the Gita Govinda of Jayadeva, the great text that he painted provided visual parallels to, so to speak. There is a peripheral mention passing mention of how Radha, who is wandering about disconsolate in the groves of Vrindavan and so on, how she's uncomfortable. And her condition is compared by the poet that it's like the hot wind which emerges from the bellies of snakes which have wrapped themselves around the sandalwood trees in the Malayachal mountains. And these hot winds are seeking their way to move northwards to immerse themselves in the snows of the Himalayas. Can you imagine a painter picking up a theme like this? I mean, it could easily have passed away. He was not committed to doing a visual parallel to every single verse. But he does that. And this extraordinary painting, this kind of crystalline rocks that you and I are seeing, the left part is there as the snakes around the trunks of the trees, and towards the right, of course, are bereft of those. And in that narrow passage, the hot breaths emerging from the bellies of snakes are moving northwards to bury themselves in the snows of the He could also move in a different direction altogether. He can move up there and create this cloud of great unknowing in which you and I find ourselves. Demons are here, of course. But I'm trying to establish for you the kind of thing that he could think of doing. Manku is a, truly a thinking painter of his own time, and he does this. But to go back to the treatment of water, this is also by Mark, 1740. Brahma has emerged from the, the navel of Vishnu, and there it is, and he sits there, looking in all directions, foreheads. Notice one detail, remarkable detail, how sharply Manku must have observed things. In the Gomuk glove, the top right, the only finger emerging is the, this forefinger, which is never used, which has to be kept unused when you are telling beads, the beads must be told like this. So this is in a certain sense to negate the possibility that he might have been using the forefinger for doing that. And so He knew exactly, precisely what he was doing. He had observed extremely well and he knew how to render it so. But notice the water here. That's what I want to draw your attention to. This is not the kind of water which he did in the Hiranyagar painting, for instance. There are some little lines here, some little waves, but nothing of that kind. This again is a detail I've taken from another painting from the Bhagavad Puran. There are lines and ends, to, but nothing of this kind. Nor in this, a Geet Govind detail. The bank of the river Yamuna, on the, in which the whole drama uh, unfolds and so on, Radha and Krishna's love. There is a kind of a foamy edge to this particular river, but this is what attracts me and tells me that there is a great deal of thought behind what he was doing. So we're not looking at the work of an ordinary run of the mill. We're looking at a man who closed his eyes 
and visualize. I have titled, subtitled this talk of mine, Conversations with the Gods, because he seems to have had the ability to close his eyes and enter that world. As I was saying a couple of days ago, I hope you were the only one there and the audience is not repeated. I said there are all kinds of God men, I mean, in this particular <coughs> land of ours, and about many of them, their disciples say with great pride, Kisab was Ratko Ganga Jate, so very Ajate. So whether this happens or not, I do not know, but I am convinced that. Manaku must have, in the night, moved to the world of the gods, converse with them, and come back in the morning. <laughs> An astonishing ability. And when he talks about, there are inscriptions on top of drawings which we shall have occasion to see, in which he talks about the gods as if they are his mates, and their fellow beings, their neighbors, or juniors, Brahma Baita. I Brahma Baita. I mean, no honorific, no Sri Brahma, no Brahma Maharaj, no Brahma Devita, Brahma Baita. Vishnu Galanda, Vishnu is talking, right, like that. I mean, an eye to eye, this kind of a contact, at that particular level, he is talking about the greatest of the gods of Hindu mythology. So there are conversations here. There are, there is the ability on his particular part to tap that particular world and paint images with a sense of conviction. This is the only way it could have happened. <coughs> the conviction shines through in practically that Manuku painted or the Gita Govind or the Bhagavad Purana. Well, let's look at him, Manuku. By great good fortune, a portrait of his has survived. This man, whom we can see from a little closer, has a kind of aristocratic bearing, that kind of a sharp nose, that intelligent look in the eye, that they look mark on the forehead, looking straight into the distance, envisioning things. And this is the context in which he lives. So this is a, <coughs> his portrait at a slightly older age than the one we saw a moment. This is his father, Pandit Singh, the painter in his own right. Incidentally, this particular drawing is given the number two. There must have been a number one, which was Pandit Singh's father, Hasnu by name, whom we also know about, but we don't have any work of it. And this is his younger brother, Nain Sukh. So this is the family, and this is a Pandit who must have been a mentor of Manu and of Nansu. He's a contemporary Pandit Dinmani Rana is his name. We have three portraits of him, one in which he's playing chess with an uncle of the Maharaja, the lead singer of Aguler, and so on. But this is what he is. There is a text called the Dilip Ranjani, which is a chronicle of the state of Guler. Guler you might never have even heard of. It's a tiny little speck on the map of India. Tiny little thing, place, a principality. If you're a good walker, you could have crossed it from one, uh, this particular border to the next in a day. Like That's small. But it had the great good fortune of nurturing talent such as Pandit Dinmani Rana, the Dilip Ranjini, it is said, was a Brihaspati incarnate. He was the master of all kinds of shastras and so on. He knew astrology and astronomy and mathematics and literature and he knew, could recite texts backwards and so on like this and so on. That is the kind of reputation he had. He is a Rana by, by caste and the family to which Manuku belonged were also Rana's. So there is some kind of a connection there, even if there is no caste connection. The connection was, he was there, he was the Raj Guru of the Raja, the lead singer of Udair, and it is he who might well have guided Manuku's hand and shared with him the mystifying 
nature of the texts that he was addressing himself. This very, very fuzzy thing, which I, a photograph I took of the Bahi in the year 19, year of our Lord, 1964 or something like that. And I had a tiny little Alpha Optima camera, which I just brought back from. This is all I was able to take. But the two and a quarter lines at the very top are in Manku's hand. Manku Trakhan Sri Gulere Dabasi Bete Sehude Pote Hasnude Sambat 1793, which translates itself to 1736. And then entries by two cousins of his. One is called Gual, the other one is called Punnu, and there this entries by them. Right? So this is the only thing that we have in Manku's own hand, but there are Bahi entries which are absolutely replete, chock a block full of information, copies made from old Bahis. If you notice the third entry, Chatere Basi Gulerke, Kushal Vapattu, Bete Manakke, Pote Sehuke, Nenao Manak Bete Sehuke, and then Kushal Bhungaji Aya, Asal Khulal Purane Patare. This is a pandas abstract of the entries which were earlier. So we have kept the name of Manaku again and again in these records. But that's not what you are interested in. What you are interested in might be works like this. Manaku's father, Pandit Sev, had painted a Ramayana on a small scale. And he had brought the story up to the point where the battle between Ram and Ravan began. The Lanka Khand. Suddenly, Manku must have been 25 years of age at this time. For some reason, Pandit Sev's work came to an end. Might have fallen sick, might have died, we don't know. And Manku decided to continue the story. But he suddenly expanded the scale of those leaves and painted them on a scale of the size of a Hamza <coughs> But extraordinary work again. There are connections with his father's work, which shall, I can't go into that at this moment. My time is not too limited, your patience might be. So I'll, 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 I'll take you slow, uh, fairly quickly through this. Raman, Lakshman, Hanuman, Angad, Yamban seated at the bottom right. The army of bears and monkeys which Rama had has, is laying siege to the golden lanka of Rama. That golden lanka, the facade of that great <coughs> golden palace, on the top of which there is Ravana seated. And by the side of Ravana are two demons, <coughs> his underlings. And he asked them, he said, I want to know what the strength of the enemy's forces is. So you go and find out for me, but you cannot go like demons. So you transform yourselves into monkeys so that you will not be detected. And so those two come as monkeys, just outside of the gate. The, the group of monkeys that you see here, you really have to look at it in, with great intensity to see how extraordinary is Manku's observation. Everyone is, the people at the, the group at the bottom right, the group at the bottom, they are paying attention to the conversation between Ram and Lakshman and Vibhishan. But those two have come in, and some of them, the monkeys have been nudging each other and so on. Yeah, who, who are these? They don't belong to us. <laughs> and they and, and cranes, necks, and expressions of wonder and disbelief in their eyes and so on. <coughs> you can see it from a little closer. This is what Manku did. I mean, he entered the soul of these animals and the range of expressions that you see in the faces of these monkeys is quite extraordinary. These are the demons who are emerging from the gate of Lanka to get ready for battle. 
and I like you to see these demons, the most, the friendliest demons in the world. <laughs> now, but he has a kind of iconography for a demon, for these Dhanavas. And the iconography is that they have fangs protruding from the corners of their mouths, that they have horns, that they wear only shorts, must have been short of textiles, but the feet are like bird's toes. And around the knees, there are concentric circles. You will, he never lets go of this. Whenever you see a demon with rings of circles on, on his um, knees and two fangs and so on, you can be sure he came from Anukul's stable. Oddly enough, the story is not continued in the form of paintings. Drawings take over. And as many as 25 of these drawings have survived, 19 of them are in the Prince of Wales Museum in Bombay, from the Sardor of Tata collection. The ability of Monaco to create a feeling of panic, scurl, and blare, and noise of the battlefield is astonishing. Indrajit, Ravan's son, has hid himself in the clouds. And he is showering a rain of arrows down at the ground. And there's panic everywhere. The donkeys, bears, I mean, do not know where it is all coming from. And then Rama asked ten of his assistants to go up into the skies, pierce the cloud cover, and see where Indrajit is. So those ten monkeys up there, trying to shave themselves with rocks in their hands and so on. They are going up there, but down here, Rama and Lakshmi are issuing instructions, and monkeys and bears are dying like flies. But in this, there is drama again. And the detail from the same drawing. Just notice one detail, the bottom row, the second from the left. There is a friendship between a monkey and a bear, clearly. And as the arrows fall, one monkey lays himself flat on his friend's back to save him and bear the sling and arrow of outrageous watch. Who could? I mean, the humanity of it, the observation of the part of it. The text does not talk about this, this so this monkey saved this particular bear. But this is all coming from the mind of Monaco. On the battlefield, those arrows pierce Ram and Raman, and they lie senseless on the ground, and the sense of panic of being the army, the bears and the, the monkeys. And you can feel their hearts pounding. If our leaders, Ram and Raman, are gone, then what hope do we have? not of a snowflake in hell. But just look at the details. How he constructs a bed of arrows. Some have pierced the bodies. And then these arrows of Indraji turn themselves into snakes. He had this great ability to do that. And the snakes are beginning to spread and create a kind of stranglehold and this is Ram, and this is Lakshman, and so on. How do they get out of this? Garuda arrives, and seeing Garuda, then the snakes flee, and so on, and they are freed, and so on. But this is the kind of thing that creates a sense of extraordinary drama in the work of the Siege of Lanka series. Now the assault on the Lanka citadel has begun. And just study these characters. One of them has sort of dared and is beginning to climb up this and he's beckoning, he's turning back and so on. Chalo bhai, to aap bhi chalo, mein bhi chalo. <laughs> but then we take leave of the siege of Lanka. We are sure that Rama's army will win. So we can now enter a different world. That of the Geet Govind of Jayadeva. 
the lilt of the Gita, the rhythms that the poet was able to create, the alliterative kind of things and so on like this, which Jayadeva was a great master of. Lalita, Laranga, Lata, Parishita, Vajra. And in this world, there is no such thing as conflict of kind. The battle scene, they're all gone. But there are other things that are happening. There is distance between lovers. They come together, they part again. There is recrimination, there is suspicion, there is accusation, defense, counter-accusation, and so on, so on, all that happens. Extraordinary as a document. 151 paintings make up this particular series. Practically every shloka is illustrated. Illustration is a word I, I hate to use, because it is not illustration. These are visual parallels. Right? It is an interpretation of that in visual terms. So, this is towards the end. Of the, I want it to be shown at this particular time because I just want calm to descend upon ourselves after that early, early, the, the skull and blare of the siege of Lanka. The lovers are finally united, 12th circle, and the rest of the world ceases to exist. Time seems to have come to a stop with the lover fit, lost in each other. He does this quite often. Many people do this. He does this that he cuts a tree into one half, suggesting as if there are other trees at the other, at beyond that. Right? This tree is both full. But there, he does that. And now, it's a time for us, you and me, to soak ourselves in the colors that Manukur was the master of. The flat monochromatic orange red background, the strip of sky at the very top, and so on, the edge of the river with its foam, and so on and so forth. And then this intensity of the look between the eyes of the lovers. The, in the very beginning of the Gita Govind, there is a long description of the ten avatars. Keshava, Dhrita, Meena, Sharira, Keshava, Dhrita, Kachyap, Rupa, and so on like this. But then there is a kind of one verse at the end of that in which all ten avatars are spoken of. And Manaku devises this extraordinary measure. Vishnu, Chaturbhuj, Shakti Chakra Kadapadma now incarnates himself, in a, he presents himself, Jayadev standing in left, and Manuku, with great intelligence, brings every single avatar in a minute little uh, panel, panel of minute little figures and so on, at the very top, an encapsulation of all the ten avatars, while he Jayadev stands rendering obeisance. This is the colorful. And you can read that Muni Vasubhini Somi, Samnita Vikramavde, and so on. Like this. This is the one in which was the subject of great controversy between Pandit A, Pandit B, Pandit C, Kal Khandalawala, and Moti Chandra, and, and uh, Rai Krishnadas and um, V.S. Agrawal and so on. Everyone was called into, into pressed into service. The word Manuku occurs in that. But many people said Manuku is not, cannot be a painter in the colophone. It must be the name of the patron, right? Some princess. But it is obviously not correct. Anyhow, I'll not take you to that because, I, as I mentioned the other day, I mean, one of them was willing to go to a court of law to prove his point and so on. I think it must have been Karl Kandalaval as a barrister. Like, like this. Anyway, so the controversy is more or less settled by now. And I think anyone who does not believe that this is the name of Manuku, the painter, which is in this and so on, would really have to seek guidance from there else.
the opening folio of the Gita. It starts off like this. Nanda is in the fields as a cowherd along with Gopas, Krishna and Radha. And then a thunderstorm brews and he says to Radha, who is a little older than Krishna in the, in the story, take him home, this young boy will get afraid, the kind of a noise and so on and so forth. What happens on the way home is another story. <laughs> right? But she takes him uh, back and so on. But this is the moment and so on. Notice the details. Notice that extraordinary atmospheric effect that is created up in the strip of the sky at the very top. Notice the expression in the eyes of the cows, which are also getting to be afraid of the thunder in the sky and so on. And one of them in particular, the, the, white, the, the white skinned and so on towards the water, you can see terror in her eyes. What is going to happen? This study of this nature of animals. But it looks like a story is going to unfold. There's no story in the, in the thing. The story is only of, you know, Anunaya, they said that and uh, whatever. Taking these paintings one by one, the background does not remain constant. It is not always orange red. It moves from one color to the other, to the third, to the fourth, and so on and so forth. One, note, one detail which we cannot miss. Manuku used in this particular series a wonderful device, tiny little beetle wing cases, which are placed in, in the, as a substitute for emeralds in the crowns and the jewelry. We can't see it here. Maybe just a little listening thing, but that's what he does. But he uses it only in this series would have been completely inappropriate in the Siege of Lanka series, would also be inappropriate in the Bhagavad Puran series which is going to come afterwards. And Radha is right. I mean, she suspects him of being sort of a, a, a character not to be trusted. And the Saki always goes and reports to, to Radha, don't trust him. He's, he's a very mercurial kind of a character. He's un, untrustworthy. Because I've seen him with my own eyes, as he says, surrounded by all these women, adoring, and he is not shy. I mean, he is eager to embrace them and so on. But notice the attitudes of, now you can see some glistening, I think, in the, in the emerald piece. <laughs> and the range of trees in the background. I mean, it was easy enough for Manuku to leave the trees out. Easy enough for him to have the same tree repeated in a forest that can happen and so on. But he creates one, second, third, fourth, five, six, set of this range of trees, like the range of women who are falling over themselves. Again and again. Sakhi, the gopis ask Krishna, dance for us. And he's ready to dance. <laughs> Right? Yeah, these gopikas. Right? Are able to ask him to dance for them and he dances. Let's look at this, this detail of this dancing figure. Now who would not fall? in love with these eyes that seem to whisper into the ears. And this extraordinary I am intrigued also by the fact that those insects which appear up there probably are a reference to his name as Madhava, which comes from Madhu, right? which is sweet as honey. <coughs> They are layering in these paintings. That has to be internalized. Krishna, like a forlorn lover, Krishna, having given up all hope of her coming, 
seeking the help of the Sakhi to ask her to proceed to him and so on like this. It takes some doing to create a series of 151 paintings with two or three characters and in various situations. Go, leave your noisy anklets behind, she says to, the, to Radha. And go and enter his grove. But then the divinity of Krishna, Jayadev the poet, rendering him homage, and then of course toward the end, <coughs> everything calms down. The two of them sit and he does entirely her bidding. Kuru Yadvanandana. Karo. Right? Now settle my hair. Now put a bindi on my forehead. Now put dangling sort of earrings in my ears and so on. Like this. And she says, paint my breast with floral patterns. And of course, what could be less inviting than that for Krishna? <laughs> but one detail, which you and I might notice, while the liquid musk with which he is to paint is in a shell which she holds up, he has the brush in his hand, but the brush is in his left hand. <coughs> And I, my guess is that Manuku was left-handed. <laughs> like Nadru Zaman. We have a portrait of his painting with the left hand. Like this. And this is not the only thing on which I base myself and so on. But then, of course, toward the end, it all is Vishnu on the waters of eternity, Shesha Shai. The Murumukutakati Kachani Karmurali Urumal is gone, right? It is now he in his great incarnate form as Vishnu. This detail from the Krishna dancing, notice a detail. The Sakhi at the in front, she, her arm is left but her hand is right. On that is, is grafted on to the left arm. Another little clue that I think tells me that he was like this. And with regard to the study of, it's not all idealized, not all stylized, but this figure of a cowherd must have been in Manuku's neighbor. So he's capable of doing all kinds of things. We, Nansuk is a different person. Nansuk is very interested in portraiture. Manku does not seem to be. And for a moment we might be learning ourselves into the belief that he did not know how to portrait or portrait people. We we'll see that that is absolutely not right. It is his wont, it is his preference to lose himself in the world of the gods rather than to engage himself with these people who are part of a world which is Baluki Bhid, Pavan Kakam. Then we enter the third major series, which must have consisted of something like 1,500 works, the Bhagavad Puran. And the Bhagavad Puran, of course, is the greatest Puran of the, you know, of the 18 Puranas by the Vaishnavas, place at the height, and so on. So there are these constant goings on in the Bhagavad. Yajyas, Havan. And this is Pradapati who is holding this. And all these people, all these gods and sages are assembled. And there is this tiny little picture. And then the four priests sit inside that. And Manku knows that the four priests have to perform. A Hotri, an Udgatri, and a and a Brahman. Without them, this thing cannot be complete. So four priests almost always, and there are it's not the only painting 
We are showing a hover in progress, but again and again we see them. My, I was intrigued by those two figures at the bottom left, who seem to be neither of the world of the gods nor of sages and so on. And my guess is they are Pitris, means the ancestors who are always invited to be present. This is a world in which a rishi like Atri stands on it and performs tapas for 1,000 years. This is a world in which Prachetasas who sit, stand under water and do tapas to have a darshan of Shiva. And this is where the Prachetasas, when they get angry that the forest is not allowing us to do this, then they blow out fire from their mouths. And they forest is flattened. This is the world that Manuku was most comfortable in. And this is the world he brings into being, envisions to bring it within our reach. An extraordinary episode in this Bhagavad Puran. It's a, Manuku was very fond of dense narration. He would take a theme and not let go of it. Right? He just, I mean, like a crocodile. And then with that, something in his jaws and sort of and holds on to it. And he does that. Now here we are, the episode of Prithvi. Prithu is the great ruler. And Prithvi is named after him, as we know. Right? Now Prithu is the great ruler, and the great ruler, as a, as a ruler who cares for his subjects, sees hungry and famished subjects and asks them, why are you like this? And they say, the earth is not yielding us what she holds. And Prithu says, I will make, it, make her yield. And so it, the word for Prithu, for, for earth in Sanskrit is go. And go also means a cow. Go also means senses, go also means speech, and so on. But here, the earth appears in the form of a cow, and he questions her, Prithu does. Why are you holding yourself back? This episode is one chapter of the Bhagavad Puran, and there are 17 or 16 paintings of the same episode that he, after he, he pursues her, she runs, and he pursues, shooting with the left hand, notice that, yeah? And in the previous painting also, he's addressing her with the left hand, right? There's a preference for left-handedness in, in, in Mahanukusi, anyhow. So she, he captures her and says, now I will make you stand in the courtyard of my palace and I will invite all creatures, divine, subdivine, animals, and reptiles and so on to come and take from you what they can. And in folio after folio, the gods come, Prithu is seated in the left, and he is watching what is going on. And the cow stands, allowing herself to be milked. The quadrupeds come, and they take whatever they can from her. The snakes come. And take the poison from her, which, is, which does belong to the earth. I cannot show you all 17 of these paintings, but they're extraordinary things. No artist in the entire history of Indian painting that I know of has ever attempted this particular episode. Then there is the great episode of the Varaha Avatar. The gods are buried. The earth has been taken into the waters. Hiranyaksha is the demon who has done that, brother of Hiranyakashipu. And Vishnu incarnates himself as the third incarnation, Vara. But first appears like an ordinary poor. And then he assumes a great form of Naravara. The battle is raging. This not one episode. The, the episode is one, not one for you, but something like 15 or 16 for you. 
in which he keeps on tracking them. What is happening? He throws a trishul and Vishnu sort of cuts it off with his chakra. Right? Then he would throw a gada and Vishnu will produce his own gada. Goes on and on and on. But the waters, if you notice in the background, hundreds of years the battle was fought. And Vishnu and, and Manuku brings in those waters. And at one particular point, when he casts a magical illusion, this man does. Not man, this demon, not a uh, hidden. And then everything, all creatures flee in sheer terror. Because from the skies, rain, weapons, and pieces of flesh fall, and bones, and skeletons. The sages run, the demons run in one direction, the Gandharvas run in another direction, the Pretas run in another direction, so only Vishnu stands unmoving, looking at everything, the blessed, calm mind. <coughs> Dhruv, the story of Dhruv, <coughs> who pursues the Jakshas. <coughs> Excuse me. I think the audience should be thirsty. I mean, I, I, I'll not take more than five or seven, <laughs> maybe eight. <laughs> Dhruv goes to the Alkapuri, where the Jakshas reside. And he has to pass through all kinds of terrains and the winds part as his chariot moves. The treatment of the winds part the looseness of brushwork here, yeah, very often we see that. We are st stuck in our belief that everything is contained within firm lines. Right? It isn't. And through the story is long, we have, I'm cutting short, but it, towards the end when he, achieved, he goes to the other world and becomes a pole star. And notice, in that extraordinary circle, he sits, and up there toward the top right are Vishnu Mata, the feet of Vishnu, because he's reached that particular status place. On one occasion, Indra gets jealous of Prithu, and he's performing Ashwamedha sacrifice. And Indra does not, it felt threatened by it because so many Ashwamedha sacrifices being done by Prithu, his own throne is under, uh, under some kind of a threat. So he tries to l run away with the horse. And Prithu's son follows him, brings the horse back. Then he again comes, Indra does. And this time he, can, he has to flee from that scene and then he multiplies himself, takes on the guise of holy men sitting on the banks of the Ganga. But this are the guise, the <coughs> total charlatans, right? Dhurt, right? They are there. This is what I want you to concentrate upon, how Manuku has studied these figures. These Dhurtas who must have been in his neighborhood, must have been walking in the village to which he belonged and so on. Look at this. <laughs> very closely observed. I mean, you can meet them in the streets even today, right? If you are unlucky, I mean, you really can. These are sharply observed, individuated, not stylized, not standardized faces or figures. A Kanpata Yogi, a Jangam Yogi, right, a Deravala, I mean, who throws <laughs> like this and so on. A Vaishnava, like this, and an Akhori at the extreme. That is what he's capable of doing. 
studying with great intensity characters and with great ability to render them with types he, he knows very well. There are seven people here and he can just, I mean, these are people who are praying to the king to be more lenient and so on. But just notice, not one person is like the other. Either moustache, beard, the eyebrow, the dress and so on keep changing from one to the other. Or when you, Thruv is going up there, then his, his Rath is being met by those who welcome him, that part of Rath is there. Apsaras and Kinnaras and Vidyadharas are all there. And the, notice the treatment of the cloud. Once again, that extraordinary brushwork, loose <coughs> and fire. In the Vishnu Dharmotar Puran, at the very beginning, he said, in their one particular text, one who can render fire and smoke and clouds is a true painter. These atmospheric effects and this. Anybody would run from these characters. <laughs> but Brahma, who's created them, and they turn on him. So he flees in sheer terror. Ultimately, he lands up at the court of Vishnu. We know that. Right? And when Sandhya appears as the goddess, then these hungry characters again are followed. Vishnu, who has already reached the abode of Vishnu, Brahma has. And Sandhya turns, because they all fall in love with this beautiful woman, Sandhya, <laughs> and are lusting after her, but it ends peacefully. <laughs> <clears throat> after the fourth skanda, the paintings finish and drawings begin. And the facility of drawing, the line, I mean, almost as if he closed his eyes and he can draw these figures. Yeah. And there are drawings which are quite exceptional. And there is an underdrawing, a charcoal drawing. Now this particular havan is taking place, the four priests are inside and so on, and there is a Bali Raja over there, some celebration is going about. In the center, if you notice, underdrawing, a charcoal drawing of two lions. They do not appear in the final thing in a firm form, but this is the first flush of thought that Manuku must have. Continuous narration, Krishna killing Dantavakra, and so we see him, the chakra is not seen yet, but this is Dantavakra, he sees him there, tries to escape, then turns around, the same figure seen twice over. The firmness of the sage Durvasa, having offended the gods, he, Vishnu's chakra pursues him, and he has to run for safety to Shiva to save him. And Durvasa, just study his face and his stance. There is a faint impression of an underdrawing around the figure of the head of Durvasa. These drawings are, must have been a thousand of them. I have tried to get as many that I could lay my hands on. More than a hundred drawings are in this particular book. And I have reconstructed the entire Heath Govan series. Out of 151, I have been able to assemble 89 of them, which is the largest number ever. We can at least see what it was like, the range of things and so on. The Gajendra Moksha. Gaja, Gajaraj, having been caught by the Graha in the waters, and then he ple pleads with Vishnu to appear, and Vishnu does come and save him. But two drawings of the same episode. The Gajendra has come out, but the Graha was really a Vidyadhar who had been cursed to be born as a girl. And so he bends down at the feet of Vishnu. But just the quality of drawing is this. 
As I was saying the other day, Howard Hodgkin would have given his left hand, I mean, to get this kind of a drawing of an elephant. <laughs> then, the same elephant. Now, he was also cursed to be born an elephant. And he gives up his life, ebbs out of him. Life, prana, breath, escaping his body. And he bends, and then he emerges back. Two studies of the same elephant. Back, please. The constellation. And then, calm descent. Sunkar ji say, Havas me thandak si aapase. That kind of thing. Yun jayse shab ko chandni chupke zameen par aage rahe, uthne ki himmat na rahe, yekin vahi ki ho rahe. This calm descends upon you when you see this. Shukadev reciting the Bhagavad to Parikshit. The text says thousands of sages had assembled to listen to them, but Manaku tells them, go home. We just want the two of them here. Conversation, quiet, calm conversation. That is what it is like. What happens afterwards, I do not have the, the time at this time. He changes, he changes here. He, but I'm in, intrigued by Nansuk inside a golden egg. Right? Was it a motif in common in the family? I do not know. <laughs> but this is what it is. We're back to where creation began. The next generation, Manku had two sons, Nansuk had four. Fatu and Kushala were the sons of Manku. And, Ma and Gauru and, uh, and Nikka had said there was the son of men. So that generation produced some of the greatest works in all of Pahadi art. And we are taking a step beyond what we have seen so far. And that is the next generation who turns up a page like this. This fire and the fire which emerges from the mouths of the Prajetasas is identical. The painter knows that in our tradition, fire is Sapta Jiva, has seven tongues, and each tongue has a name, right? This is Pradipta, this is uh, um, Spulingini, and so on and so forth. The, the, the tongues of the fire is very well aware of. So, but with this fire, and the fire in the belly of Manaku, which burns, Luminous is where I would like to end. Thank you very much for being here. Ashok is asking me, Ashok is asking me, will I take any question? I said, no. Har ek sawal ka, shayad koi jawab to ho. Har ek sawal to manat ka se jawab nahi. Well, friends, this is one of the most brilliant, illuminating lecture that we had among the various memorial lectures we ever had. And we were brought so close to a great, comparatively unknown master who was in Indian tradition only 200 years ago. So thank you very much, Sadhu Swami. And I think he deserves a thunderous applause.
for a minute. <laughs> we have to do a bit of tom tomming, you know. After all, we do all this, so we listen to what we are doing. As many of my friends tell me, we are doing tour games, <laughs> which we are. <laughs> Why not? On 21st September at the IICMX, we have Arch Kavita, a, a learning series of poetry reading by Hindi poets. On 27th September, we have we are starting a new series called Aram. Each time we are inviting a young dancer and a young musician to perform. Uh, so it will be 27th September, Aram at the Triveni Kala Sangam, uh, which will have Odyssey performance by Paditi Joshi and from I think Bangalore and vocal recital by Mandal Gadgil from Pune. On 3rd and 5th October in the Stein Auditorium here, we have another annual festival called Uttaradhikar, where we present some of the disciples chosen by the gurus themselves. So this time you will have disciples of Pandit Abhin Bari, Kumukri Lakya, Preeti Patel, Ashwini Bhide, Sarupa Sen, and Ustad Abdul Latif Khan. On 13 October, we have the next Dayatrish Memorial Lecture by Ramin Jehan Begalu, the role of the intellectual in the age of Trump. <laughs> so, there you are. All of you are invited. Thank you very much.